the suburban Gothic. Unlike with a traditional Gothic mansion, where ghosts and secrets seem destined to lie between the walls, suburbia offers an overdose of the ordinary, or at least it's supposed to. After all, suburbia appeals precisely for its safety and security. Much as the director Toby Hooper took advantage of in Poltergeist, it was precisely the contrast between the banality of the suburban home and the horrors tucked inside that made these instances of horror so wildly incongruous. As John Carpenter, known for his horror classics Halloween, The Thing, and Christine explains, if horror can get there, and he means the suburbs, it can get anywhere. So a filmmaker, if he plays with that, can create fear, lots of fear. Similarly, author Stephen King explains that in his ideal horror story, the monster shouldn't be in a graveyard in decadent old Europe, but in the house down the street. Unsurprisingly, since one can be seen as a response to the other, the advent of the suburban Gothic coincided with the frenetic suburban sprawl that followed World War II. Its origin is often traced to the work of Shirley Jackson, known for short stories such as The Lottery and the novel The Haunting of Hill House, as well as the work of Richard Matheson, known for his novels I Am Legend, A Stir of Echoes, Hell House, and Bidtime Returns. Jackson and Matheson took the vision of a suburban utopia and fused it not only with current social anxieties, but also with a distinctly Gothic atmosphere. Both Matheson and Jackson explored themes common to this new and potentially unsettling suburban life, such as isolation, depression, and repressed trauma. In haunted home narratives, the repressed trauma is often emotional, made up of grief and loss, but still the past invading the present. As Robin Wood writes in his article, Return of the Repressed, the concept of the terrible house represents an extension of its inhabitants' personalities and, specifically, signifies the dead weight of the past crushing the life of the younger generation, the future. In turn, Barry Curtis writes that ghosts and the dark places where they dwell have served as powerful metaphors for persistent themes of loss, memory, retribution, and confrontation with unacknowledged and unresolved histories. Ghosts represent anxieties over the potential porousness of the barrier between life and death, between past and present. In many haunted home narratives, the haunted house represents a specific point where the past refuses to stay in the past and instead threatens the present and the future. In The Babadook, for example, the film's primary characters, a mother, Amelia, and her son, Sam, are haunted by the unresolved grief and loss of her husband and his father, Oscar. Sam has no problem talking about his father's death, but Amelia refuses to talk about Oscar at all. Amelia is so repressed, in fact, that for most of the film, she's not even capable of being loving to her son. Amelia and Sam's relationship worsens during the film as Sam begins to insist that a monster, the Babadook, from one of his books is real. Both Amelia and Sam stop being able to sleep. Roaches infest the house and doors open and close by themselves. Amelia's repeated attempts to destroy the Babadook fail as the book and the monster keep returning. Near the end of the film, the Babadook pushes Amelia to revisit her husband's death, forcing her to expel her grief and trauma in a wave of fury. This release then allows her to dominate over the Babadook, trapping him in the basement where he remains locked indefinitely. While this seems like resolution, the fact that she cannot get rid of him entirely reflects the fact that her trauma remains. It is just more repressed, locked further away. 
In the Netflix series, The Haunting of Hill House, themes of unresolved grief and trauma are everywhere. The narrative cuts back and forth between multiple timelines, following the tragic and terrifying events that take place when the Crane family moves into Hill House and intercutting with present day storylines, exploring the long term impact of those events. Trevor Macy, executive producer of The Haunting of Hill House, confirms that he sees a direct link between repressed trauma and hauntings. A ghost is a memory of past trauma, he describes. The things we carry with us emotionally, in a very real sense, determine what we are afraid of and show us who we are. When asked about the choice to tell the story of the Crane family in a non-linear fashion, Macy explains that the primary purpose was to demonstrate the links between the character's childhood trauma and their struggles as adults. When you are exploring the roots of trauma, he says, those are inseparable from childhood, and fear is largely inseparable from childhood. So you tell the story of these children and the way the ripples affect them as adults. In Hill House, the narrative of why the characters moved in there is an important fact for the audience to understand in order to relate to the characters as adults. As the director of the Hill House series, Mike Flanagan explains, each of us dug so deep into our own families and stories to try and inform the show. It has to be about the way every family is a haunted house and everyone is wrestling with their ghosts from their own childhood and beyond. Flanagan says that ghosts are boring unless they are directly tied to an experience or, mo or emotion or something that's intrinsic to a character. After all, as he points out, we're all haunted as people. For him, the primary point of interest behind the Hill House story is the way every family is a haunted house and everyone is wrestling with their ghosts from their own childhood and beyond. Interestingly, Flanagan makes the residual effect of childhood trauma even more prevalent in his Netflix adaptation than it is in the original novel. Ruth Franklin, author of the Shirley Jackson biography, A Rather Haunted Life, observes that the Netflix adaptation argues brutally and constantly, also Freudianly, that we never truly get over childhood trauma. We just repress and repeat it. All five of the children in the Netflix miniseries reflect the repress repeat cycle of repetition compulsion through depression, addiction, or other self-destructive behavior. In contrast, in the original book, only Eleanor reflects this cycle of trauma and repression. A similar theme is featured in It, Chapter 2, which, while primarily taking place in the present day, features frequent flashbacks to 1989. The film emphasizes the connection between the two timelines by cutting back and forth between scenes of the characters as children and scenes of them as adults. Interestingly, once the adults have taken down the evil creature Pennywise, who has haunted them since they were children, the scars on their hands that they collectively made to commemorate their bond and their promise to come together if Pennywise returned, disappear, a physical reflection of the metaphorical scars healing within them. They have dealt with their childhood monsters, both the literal and the figurative ones. Another kind of trauma that occurs in haunted home narratives is that which is tied to the physical walls of the house. Shirley Jackson had been interested in the work of Nander Fodor, known as an expert on poltergeists and other paranormal phenomena, as well as an associate of Sigmund Freud's. Fodor believed that ghosts and other related phenomena are actually external manifestations of repressed conflicts within the subconscious mind. Fodor also believed that homes could absorb the traumatic events that happened within them, which could cause a genuinely haunted house. The sudden appearance of a ghostly presence could be triggered, according to Fodor, by the activation of past negative energy by similar energy in the present. 
In Birth, the 11th episode of American Horror Story Murder House, Constance hires the medium, Billy Dean Howard, to help banish the spirits of Chad and Patrick. As Billy walks around the Harmon family's home, she comments that she senses so much pain, so much longing and regret, fear, sadness, guilt. When Constance asks if Billy can get rid of Chad and Patrick, Billy explains that targeting a particular spirit is going to be difficult since so many spirits fill the house. The only recourse is to try and dislodge them from the paramagnetic grip of the house. When Violet asks what that is, Billy responds, the evil. It's a force just like any other, created by events, events that unleash psychic energy into the environment, where it's absorbed like the way a battery stores energy. This phenomenon is visible in places like prisons or asylums because negative energy feeds on trauma and pain. In haunted home narratives, physical location traps our characters as effectively as emotional trauma does. And one of the reasons for this is because the house is rarely ordinary, often taking on human characteristics. In Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, for example, the protagonist describes the vacant eye-like windows and the evidence of the sentience to be found in the gradual yet certain condensation of an atmosphere, as well as in the arrangement of the stones and decayed trees. The result of this sentience, Poe writes, can be found in the silent and terrible influence that the house had on the Usher family. The animated film Monster House revolves around a sentient house that terrifies its entire neighborhood, attacking and eating neighborhood children and even police officers and their police car. Unsurprisingly, adults refuse to believe the children who witness these attacks. Forced to contend with the problem themselves, the children discover that the house is actually a fusion, a fusion of a human soul with the man-made structure, and that the only way to kill it is by attacking its heart. In their attempt to destroy the house, the children also manage to free the ghost trapped within its walls, which then releases all those who had previously been eaten. Trauma resolved. In Shirley Jackson's novel, The Haunting of Hill House, the house is also described as a sentient being, not just replete with atmosphere, but also with personality and character. As Elena Nikolai writes, Hill House is a malevolent entity which singles out its inhabitants and bullies them with strange events. Blood oozes out of walls, random messages appear, but there are no ghosts in Jackson's book. The house can't physically harm anyone. It can, however, drive a person mad. The novel begins with a description of Hill House as not sane, standing by itself, holding darkness within. When Eleanor first sees the house, she describes it as vile and diseased. Later in the book, Jackson writes, no human eye can isolate the unhappy coincidence of line and place, which su suggests evil in the face of a house, and yet somehow a manic juxtaposition, a badly turned angle, some chance meeting of roof and sky, turned Hill House into a place of despair, more frightening because the face of Hill House seemed awake with the watchfulness from the blank windows and a touch of glee in the, in the eyebrow of a cornice. The house seems to have formed itself, flying together into its own powerful pattern, fitting itself into its own construction of lines and angles. And this construction appears deliberately designed to destabilize any humans unlucky to walk through its doors. As Eleanor observes, the house has an unbelievably faulty design, which left it chillingly wrong in all its dimensions, so that the walls seemed always in one direction a fraction longer than the eye could endure, and in another direction a fraction less than the barest possible tolerable length. Jackson never clarifies if the house is actually evil, 
if it is possessed by the ghosts of the people murdered there, or if the horrific visions are in the minds of the characters. However, at the same time, the ambiguity makes it clear that there is a psychological component that makes certain people more vulnerable than others. Sarah Lotz argues that the best haunted house narratives are never just about the dead. They're about the living and the psychological. In Hill House, the real horror comes from the tragedy that Eleanor thinks she is escaping her stultifying family situation, but she can't escape her own mind. The Netflix adaptation makes clear that the sentient qualities of the house are also to blame for the family's deterioration. Andrew Whalen writes that the matriarch, Olivia Crane, designs the perfect house for her family, but finds her blueprints corrupted by Hill House's evil influence. This corruption transforms the home from a positive vision of nurturing and fellowship into a psychic fortress. In American horror story, Murder House, um, Chad tells Vivian that her family should move. We know it, you know it, and the house knows it. In a different episode, Constance tells Violet, I questioned my sanity when I first found out, but this house, this house will make you a believer. You see, Violet, we were living here when Tate lost his way, and I believe that the house drove him to it. Similarly, in Stephen King's novel, The Shining, the Overlook Hotel is the source of the evil rather than the character of Jack Torrance. One of the reasons that King was critical of Stanley Kubrick's film adaptation is that King felt Kubrick had diminished the role of the hotel, chalking up most of the evil to Jack instead. Interestingly, the film's sequel, Dr. Sleep, also based on a book by King, emphasizes the hotel both as a sentient being and as a source of evil, which is why the hotel must be burned down at the film's end. As Abra, St Abra Stone explains, the fire spread fast, destroying the hotel, purifying it. I could almost hear it screaming. I could hear it dying. In House on Haunted Hill, a remake of the 1959 film of the same title, the familiar premise is that a group of strangers have been promised a million dollars if they can survive a night at the eponymous house. The owner of the building, Watson Pritchett, who grew up in it, is convinced not only that the house is haunted, but specifically that it's alive. Stephen Price, like the others in the group, disregards Pritchett's warnings until it is too late, at which point Price concedes the house is alive. The television miniseries Rose Red also features a house imbued with human characteristics. Scripted by Stephen King and loosely based on Robert Weiss's film The Haunting, which in turn was based on Jackson's novel The Haunting of Hill House. The basic premise behind the miniseries is that Dr. Joyce Reardon, a psychology professor, is fascinated by the paranormal and determined to prove that it exists. Her plan is to bring a team of psychics to the supposedly haunted Rose Red Mansion and to document the events that she is certain will transpire. Referencing Jackson right off the bat, Reardon introduces Rose Red by saying, Shirley Jackson was right. Some houses are born bad. The third and final episode of the miniseries opens with a voiceover by Reardon speaking over various shots of the Rose Red Mansion. A house is a place of shelter, she says. It's the body we put on over our bodies. As our bodies grow old, so do our houses. As our bodies may sicken, so do our houses sicken. And what of madness? If mad people live within, doesn't this madness creep into the rooms and walls and corridors, the very boards? Isn't that a large part of what we mean when we say a place is unquiet, festered up with spirits? We say haunted, but we mean the house has gone insane. 
Much as horror narratives provide an allegorical outlet for exploring our fears and anxieties about poorly repressed grief and trauma, the suburban Gothic, with the suburban home as its centerpiece, makes repeated attempts to portray the home as we are afraid it might be, the locus of debt, dysfunction, and death. A close examination of the home and everything that lies within exposes, exposes the rot at the heart of suburbia, the ugliness behind the misogyny, oppression, and racism barely concealed behind the white picket fence. Thank you for listening.